I'm Austin Gwynn, and the lights of Kimbrough Stadium revealed a powerful West Texas A&M team as they notched another conference victory and shut out the Wildcats 36 to nothing. And I'm Taylor Langston. The Wildcats may have gone down against West Texas A&M, but they have a chance to rise up in a homecoming game against the Mustangs of Midwestern State. It's all right here on the Ken Collins Show. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm Taylor Langston, of course, joined by head coach Ken Collins and filling in for Grant Boone, Austin Gwynn. Coach, this is the first time that you guys have been shut out since 2001. Let's talk a little bit about this WT game and what you saw from the sideline, just sort of your perspective of the game. Well, uh, I am, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you that I, I'm, I'm probably more shocked than anybody that we weren't more competitive than we were. Uh, I thought it was a great atmosphere. I thought our guys were ready. It was wonderful weather. A lot of people in the stands, and uh, and we simply didn't compete the way that uh, that we should have. So it was a it was an afternoon of in an evening of frustration, and uh, you know it's it's the football is a humbling game, and it's uh, it, it, programs and and seasons have an ebb and flow to them, and uh, as a coach, you got to figure out how to how to navigate those waters. And uh, on the sidelines, we saw a sight that we weren't used to seeing, guys getting frustrated, guys yelling at each other, guys hanging their heads. Um, I know we talked a little bit about it earlier, but um, what, what did you kind of sense on the sideline? What kind of vibe did you get on the sideline? Well, uh, just a, my main thing as a, as a head coach, you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can during the course of a game to give your, give your team a chance to win. Uh, offensively, we weren't, not, we weren't doing that. So... And those guys are not used to that. So, yeah, there's going to be frustration. There's going to be, you know, it, and those, all those guys are competitors. So uh, none of that surprises me, and I would have anticipated that if you said, hey, you guys are going to go out and really struggle because uh, they're not used to that. But, uh, you know, the fact is is, is our, our defense played really well at times, and, uh, and, our, and our offense didn't. So that was, you know, with, with our guys, it, it's, it's not that big a deal. It was just a, that's what you – when you're a competitor – uh, and and things are frustrating that that manifests itself in different ways and uh, but none of that was oh you know it's it's not eating away at the core of our team or anything like that it's just they were mad and upset and uh, and I'm right there with them right, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that game when we come back stick with us right here on the Ken Hall. Welcome back to the Ken Column Show. Before we talk to the coach about that WT game, let's take a look at the game recap. Last week in the door, close to a rivalry that has existed for nearly a century, ACU and West Texas A&M began a rich history of the duel with the shutout and ended in the same fashion. Char Kendrick West kicking the game off with some healthy momentum, but it's not able to convert a first down. Mitchell Gale punts the ball away to give WT their first possession of the game. Kyrie Robinson staying on his feet, getting physical with a few ACU defenders. WT makes their way downfield and scores their first touchdown of the game on a 14-yard pass from Dustin Vaughn. The Wildcats take control of the ball, but not able to do much. Mitchell Gale sacked again. A little help from freshman Jamie Walker helps, though. Marcel Threaten to Marcus Thompson trying to bring a little confusion to the Buffs defense with a double reverse play. But a WT interception strips ACU of a scoring opportunity. So the Buffs take possession at the beginning of the second quarter. The Wildcats defense able to sniff out a run and Kyrie Robinson not able to get a first down. But it does put the Buffs close enough for a 35-yard field goal. The pressure continues. Mitchell Gale losing confidence in the pocket and not able to get the ball downfield. 
The Buffs take advantage of that. A couple of stops to Dustin Vaughn, and it's another field goal situation for WT. Sergio Castillo comes in with a whopping 56-yard field goal to send the teams in for halftime at 13-0. The Cats are back and ready to put some points up, but it doesn't take long for WT to push ahead to a 20 to nothing lead over the Wildcats. Kyrie Robinson again on the run, pushing his way home. Mitchell Gale sacked again, but stays in the game. Offensive lineman, however, Will Latsu will step out for a while after getting rolled up by one of his own players. Justin Vaughn giving receiver Jerry and Roan a chance to stretch his legs, 75 yards to be exact, and Sergio Casseo puts in another kick to get the buffs up 27 to nothing. Mitchell Gale and the ACU offense starting to look as confident as they have all game. Darian Hogg snags a 42-yard pass from Gale, but the momentum ends there with a WT interception in the end zone by Curtis Slater. The Cats take possession on their own 12-yard line, but a sack for a loss of nine yards, and they're walking the plank. WT takes full advantage, and safety on the next play lets them put two more up on the board. A final WT touchdown pass to Kyrie Robinson closes the door to this first ACU shutout since 2001. The final score, 36 to nothing. Coach Mitchell was sacked eight times in that WT game, but in four seasons of being a quarterback at ACU, he's been sacked a hundred times. It looked like from the sideline there wasn't a whole lot of continuity. If it wasn't the offensive line, it was the receivers not being able to get open. What do you think you can attribute to the fact that they weren't playing much as a unit? Well, the, my first reaction to the, the pressure that we gave up was, that's unacceptable. And, and if you're going to be a team that is going to run the ball and throw the ball and try to be balanced, you can't do that. And, uh, you know, the bottom line with the passing game, the way we do it, is it starts with what starts with the running game. And we were unable to uh, really establish any sort of consistent running game. And the problem was that they were playing coverage and still slowing down our run game, which is, which is I mean, offensive coaches never even want to admit that. And that, that's exactly what happened. Uh, so, and, and you can attribute that, number one, to WT was pretty good. And that's the first, if you really want to take a step back and look at it, at, at the big scheme of things, is, is all right, they had a defensive line that just, that, that's really good. And they outplayed our guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it wasn't just Mitchell getting, getting hit. That's, th those are really frustrating because nobody wants to give up sacks. And there, there are years where we give up eight sacks on the season. And we give up eight in one game. So, yeah, that's a bummer. But uh, the bottom line is they were really good. Our guys did not play well, and I, I've got a few thoughts on, on, on why that we, that we can talk about later, but, uh, you know, they, they basically outplayed us. And a couple of times, Mitchell probably held on to the ball a little bit. He's, he's been a little bit known for that, just to try to, hey, I'm maybe a little bit greedy at times. Hey, let me hold on to it. That guy's about to be open. Bam, too late. And those are things that, uh, those are lessons that he had to learn back in 09. And I would, I would assume that a good chunk of those 100 sacks came in 09 when he was a rookie and had no idea what he was doing. And when Mitchell was able to get the ball out of his hand, he was having to dump it down to running backs. Um, only two catches for your number one receiver, Taylor Gabriel. Uh, Darian Hogg, your number two receiver, had your two chunk plays back to back. Um, but that was pretty much it as far as uh, receiving yards by wide receivers. How do you get them more involved in the game? Plan? Well, you get them involved by running the ball and getting people out of, out of their coverage. Because if people don't respect your run game, they're going to leave safeties deep and, as, and you know, corners as run support. And, uh, you know, our plan going into that game was to run the ball, let's, let's throw some screens, slow those, slow those guys down as far as their D-line. Uh, and we weren't able to do those effectively enough uh, to get people to get out of their coverage. And as soon as you get singled up in coverage, that's when, that's when Taylor and Darian and, and uh, Harkless and those guys can go to work. We, we weren't able to do to take the first step to get that done, though. When it seemed like every weakness that the offensive line had was amplified by how strong the WT defensive line was, like you said, what do you do to pick up a line that was dominated last week, so to speak? 
Well, the when you look back at, at what happened in that game, some of it was, some of it was, you know what? We just got beat, man to man. We just got beat. Uh, a couple of times it was, uh, you know, they they ran some blitzes that were that were nothing that we hadn't seen before, but our guys were worried about just getting beat and didn't react to the normal blitz. And I think I think one thing that we probably did as coaches uh, was was probably focus a little bit too much on technique. Uh, because when you have guys that, when you have new guys uh, in this particular uh, instance, your offensive line, when you have new guys that are starting for you, the foundation you give them is the technique. All right, you have to do this technique, the technique, technique. Basically, what that does is give them a foundation to to be able to win those one on ones as they grow into a player. Well, uh, as I'm using my technique, for example, if 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 I look up and that guy's into me so fast and he is, and I realize, okay, that guy's a little quicker than what I thought. Now I'm thinking, oh gosh, can I block the guy? Now then 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 the wheels start to wobble, and that's that's if, for any player, whether you're an offensive lineman, a receiver. Mitchell went through that in '09. Uh, all new players go through that, and that's probably it was amp it was amplified. Uh, probably because they were they were a little bit concerned about their technique, and this you know of course this week it's hey, you know what if your technique's not all that great that's okay turn it into a street fight, and that's we're, now we're going to see who's the toughest guy, and that's the that you you almost you don't you don't throw the technique out the window, but you do have to take a different approach because if you same if you take the same approach if the if the defensive line and the defense is 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 equally as talented which Midwestern is just very talented, you're probably going to get the same thing so. Uh, we've changed our approach a little bit. We're, pract uh, we're practicing a little bit different, so uh, we'll see how it turns out. Well, when we come back, we'll take a look around the conference with the LSC standings and schedule, so don't go far. We'll be right back here on the Ken Collins. This is the JNC Network Sportscast. I'm Brickley Golly. And I'm Jimmy Isbell. The Abilene Christian soccer team pushed past first place Incarnate Word Sunday afternoon at the Wildcat soccer pitch. Senior captain Julie Coppage fired in a line drive off a corner kick from Ashley Craig to put the Cats 1-0 in late, late in the game. The Cats controlled Incarnate Word for all 90 minutes of the game, ending up with a 14-8 advantage in shots on target and 6-0 in corner kicks. Goalkeeper Arielle Moncure played a tremendous game recording five saves and her fourth shutout of the season. The Cats returned to the field this Friday and Sunday with matches against Texas A&M and Texas Women's University. The third-ranked ACU golf team finished sixth at Carincio Cabo Collegiate this last week. Due to the rain by Hurricane Paul, however, the tournament was limited to only one round. The Wildcats shot 15 over three to finish three strokes ahead of UT Arlington and Santa Clara, who hosted the tournament. The broomsticks were out in Moody Coliseum Saturday night as the ACU volleyball team swept their conference rival. West Texas A&M stepped in ranked at number eight in the nation, but the Wildcats ended a six-year-long losing streak to the Buffs. ACU women's basketball finally kicked off Sunday afternoon. It was the team's first practice with the whole group there, including new head coach Julie Goodenough. Guard Mackenzie Langford is among the returners with her third team NCAA Division II All-American title. More veteran players include senior leadership Kelsey Smith, Shelby Shipley, and Emily Miller. The team is also flanked with some new faces, a freshman class brought in courtesy of Goodenough. Come support the Wildcats as the season kicks Saturday, November the 10th against Texas A&M International at 7 p.m. here at Moody Coliseum. Arian Hogg is known for being an animal on the field. One of ACU's standout receivers for two years running, Hogg has made a name for himself as a primary player. Last week, the Optimist got to sit down with Hogg to meet the man behind the mask. I started playing flag football in third grade, played for the Stingers for the YMCA club, local club in town. Since I was four years old, that was my dream that I wanted to do, you know, was to be an Air Force pilot. And, you know, the asthma certainly shot that down. I don't, can't imagine being anywhere else, even, you know, a bigger school or anything like that, because I want to know the people I know here. Having the football community, um, you have a lot of more accountability. I'm about to just cut your hair like I normally do. <laughs> Golly. He is mad because I cut his hair for free, but then he gets mad when I cut him last. Some people who don't have play football, they might have one or two best friends, but, you know, with football, you probably have, Ten real good friends, and but yet you still know everybody on the team. My dad is my hero to this day. You know, he always took care of me growing up, and he didn't. He doesn't expect anything less for me to graduate. You know, so I kind of do that for him. You know, that's his goal. He wants to see lived out, and I'm gonna make it happen. Who's Darian Hogg off the field? Older, 
I take care of my business, you know, class and stuff like that. And when it's time to have fun, it's time to have fun. Come on! <laughs> I'm sleepy. Some people have to be a leader in different ways. Mine's through setting example, you know, but I have to have fun on the football field. Like, even when things are going bad, I still have to smile because I'll get really frustrated with myself if things aren't going right. So it's just a way for me to, you know, be energetic and, you know, laugh and giggle on the sidelines. Helps me kind of stay calm and, you know, keep everything in perspective. Hey, Lyle. And I miss class. Freshman year, oh, <laughs> I got tired of being broke, so I lied to people and told them I knew how. So through trial and error, that's how I got on the stage I am now. <laughs> Since I'm a receiver, I have to buy a new pair of gloves for every game. I can't be physical on the track. You can hit somebody as hard as you can, and you won't get in trouble for it. So, I mean, that's the only place in life that you can do that. For the JMC Network Sportscast, I'm Jimmy Isbell. And I'm Brooklyn Golly. Join us again next week. Welcome back for more of the Ken Collins Show. Since the Thompson Collins era began, the Wildcats haven't experienced a shutout. 2001, to be more specific, was their last year to be shut out in a game. This means more than just a conference loss. ACU is all but eliminated from playoff hopes. Here's what the Lone Star Con Conference standings look like after week seven. Of course, West Texas A&M dominating the LSC. They're undefeated in conference play. Their lone season loss to Colorado State Pueblo who is currently the number one team in the country. You've got Midwestern State following them with a single conference loss to Tarleton on their season opener as well. Next is Angelo State followed by ACU in the middle of the pack with, West Te with Texas A&M Kingsville, excuse me, Eastern New Mexico and Texas A&M Commerce Incarnate Word bringing up the rear. WT looking to get another conference win under their belt today as they go up against Eastern New Mexico. Texas A&M Kingsville and Tarleton, a competitive Game between these two teams and ACU, of course, welcoming Midwestern State for their big homecoming game today. Austin, of course, we're a little bit disappointed by the way that the season has started out. I mean, what do you think right now at this point? Well, it's kind of a different position for us. We've never been eliminated from the playoffs really at any point this year since I've been here at school. And um, we've made the playoffs seven straight years. And here we are, four games left in the season. And mathematically, we're not eliminated but it really doesn't look good. So I kind of don't know what to feel. You know, it's, 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 it's different, but, um, you know, we kind of knew this was going to be a year where it would be tough to make the playoffs. A lot of teams getting better. We were probably going to regress a little bit. And uh, so it was going to be a, a little bit of a rebuilding year for ACU. And so, yeah, it, it's unfortunate that we're not in the playoffs, but we can look ahead and um, look at, um, you know, successes in years to come. Right, looking ahead, we're... This is our last year to be a Division II team. We're about to go Division I. You're going to be playing teams that are just as good, if not better, than WT. I mean, how are you going to be making that transition, Matt? Well, I think it is a good time to transition. We've got some young quarterbacks. Of course, John David is a senior next year, and he might take over next year. We don't really know. But we have a young team, so it's a good time to kind of start anew, if you will, uh, moving up in D1. Well, and if you're Mitchell Gale, you've been a part of leading and, and sort of being the structure of this team for the past four years. This season isn't something to write home about. I mean, how disappointed do you think that he is at this point? Um, I would say he's probably disappointed. He saw this year going a little bit differently. Um, his, I guess, three leading receivers coming back after last year, um, a running back that knew the system um, coming back, it, it, it looked like a good year to be Mitchell Gale. It really did. A lot of ACU records were in his sights. But uh, the offensive line has really caused him to not be able to um, excel to the potential that we know he can. Um, no Neil Tivis, no Matt Weber, and those two losses, we, we knew they were going to be big coming into the year, but they have been monumental. And he doesn't, Mitchell doesn't have any time in the pocket. When Mitchell doesn't have any time in the pocket, he's not going to complete a lot of passes. And so, yeah, you look at his stats, and boy, it sure looks like a bad year for Mitchell, but it's not really his fault. Well, and Matt, you're looking, you're looking at some of these players, and right now there are some that are looking to go you know, play ball on Sundays, some of these guys that are potential NFL prospects. How does a lackluster season, a mediocre season, so to speak, how does that affect guys that are looking to get drafted? Well, for, for guys like Morgan Lineberry, I mean, he's a kicker. He, he'll have his chance either way. It, do, it doesn't really matter for the kickers. But guys like LB Suggs that are a little undersized in the secondary, they really need to come from a good team, make a bunch of plays, you know, guys like Mitchell Gale um, had a chance to maybe be a day two, day three type guy. Now, I don't see him getting drafted, you know, because these scouts aren't necessarily popping in the tape of ACU football and watching three or four times to break it down. They see 
oh, Mitchell, 200 yards, 50% completion. That's not going to get it done. And so it, it really hurts guys like that. Well, there's a topic that's been sort of resonating this season, and it, injuries. I mean, you've got another linebacker that goes down, Thor Warner. How crucial is that? Well, we hope Thor plays on Saturday. We don't quite know. High ankle sprain is something that um, is not easily played with. Uh, even guys in the NFL, it usually takes them a couple weeks to come back from that. So we'll see. Um, but, yeah, injuries have been uh, detrimental to this team, to say the least. It's especially, you know, you, you can deal with five season-ending injuries spread out throughout the offense and the defense, but you have five season-ending injuries in the linebacking core alone. No team, no matter how much depth you have at the linebacker position, can really survive that, and it's, it's showing in ACU's poor season so far. Well, and we'll see if Thor Warner gets to see the field tonight. Stick around. We'll be right back to talk to Coach Combs a little bit more about that Midwestern State matchup. Stay right here with the Ken Combs. Coach, last time that you faced off against Midwestern State, it was a 70-28 to 28 loss to them. Just based on past experiences, based on what you've seen so far in the game from last year, I mean, how are you expecting to get ready for, for going up against them later on this afternoon? Well, number one thing is you better be able, you better be able and ready to stop the run because if you don't do that, they're going to run the ball on you for four quarters. And they can, the, the problem is with Midwestern is they can run the ball and score points while doing it, which is going to keep the ball from you and they're going to they're, they're going to drive down and, and, and score. So so our guys have got to be ready to our de it starts with the defensive line, everything just like we were talking about last week. Our guys have got to be ready to compress those running lanes cuz they've got a couple of running backs now. If you, if you give them if you give them a hole and they hit that thing going full speed, it's you know, somebody better tackle them or he's going to score. So our guys are, are going to compress and we 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 do a good job of that uh, defensive line wise. Um, and our linebackers have got to be aligned properly. They got to have their eyes in the right spot because they will run the quarterback. And their quarterbacks are fastest guy. And uh, you know he doesn't make all the yards, but but he is what uh, he'll he'll finish a team off. We've seen that already this year uh, in the fourth quarter. They wear people down, and uh, and he ends up being the difference in in their run game. So um, you know he's not as good a thrower as he is a runner. So uh, we've got to we've got to stop the run or or slow them down. I don't know that anybody can stop their running game because they're really good. They the the running game they use is is tied in so well with their personnel and they do a good job of it. That quarterback you're talking about, senior Brandon Kelsey, he's had over 100 yards rushing each of the last two weeks, and a lot like last week, he's a senior, a veteran guy. Um, but not like last week, he's a dual threat, and you've had some success on defense against dual threat quarterbacks. Do you expect to have that same kind of success? Well, I don't. I, I, I sure I expect it, but but the bottom line is our guys have got to, and we've put in a good week of practice, so I fully anticipate giving them some issues in the run game. And uh, you know, the thing is with a with a dual threat type guy is you you if you take away the ability to run, that's when they're not used to that, and you get them out of their comfort zone, and that's what happened uh, when we played against Delta State. So I'm. Uh, I'm banking on that happening tonight. Well, you mentioned uh, personnel a little bit earlier. You had another linebacker go down for Warner. He didn't get to practice a whole lot this week. Who else are you looking to sort of move in, kind of fill in the cracks for the, the depth that's essentially been dried up at this point? Well, we're constantly having to move safeties, and we're not, de we're not very deep at safety, uh, but Mike Wallace will continue to be a, 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 a big player you know, at, at linebacker. And we need Thor to, to, to play. And... Uh, He's gotten a little bit of action this week, but he's the guy that runs our stuff. I mean, he gets us lined up and makes the checks, and uh, he is uh, he is he has got a knack for the ball. And uh, uh, you know, we've lost five this year, five linebackers for the season, and he's not lost for the season. But we just we need him sharp tonight, and Jesse Harper will be able to fill in uh, and do fine. And let's not forget, it's homecoming week, so a bigger crowd than normal maybe at Shotwell. And historically, in the past, we've seen. Um, some some stops pulled out of the offense, some some gimmicks done on homecoming. Are we going to see anything here? Maybe a little wildcat offense. <laughs> the wildcat. That's just that we've run a few plays like that. But uh, ultimately, uh, you know, you can't bank a, a game plan on 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 gadgeting somebody. I mean, you can't do that. That may you know get the guys in the stands to stand up and hoop and holler. But bottom line is, you got to be efficient. You got to be clean on offense. So. Uh, that's our number one goal. It's not necessarily we need to we need to score this amount of points or get in the red zone this amount of time. It's just hey, let's just play better than we did last week 
and, and start progressing from uh, and, 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 and building on what we learned from last week. Well, in last year's game against Midwestern, we, something we did beat them at is, is passing <coughs> yards. We had Taylor Gabriel, 138 receiving yards. Is that a strength that you're expecting to sort of shine in, in tonight's game? Well, I certainly hope so because we can throw the ball, but you can only throw it as, as well as the time allotted. So uh, if, we, if Mitchell doesn't have very much time, it's going to be rough on him again. And we'll still, we'll still run our whole offense. I mean, we're not throwing the brakes really on anything. Uh, just on the biggest disappointment last week was the, the pressure we gave up in play action pass because when you the, the purpose of play action pass is to create a little bit of time uh, for Mitchell to throw it so we'll do all that and uh, and I'll be shocked if we don't uh, play much better than we did last week well we look forward to that game later on tonight uh, the game kicks off at two o'clock at Shotwell Stadium for the coach Ken Collins and Austin Gwynn I'm Taylor Langston join us again next week <laughs>